ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining this online session by the Global Peter Drucker Forum. Despite its provocative title, Snowflakes and Seniors, a manager's nightmare or secret weapon. So whatever generation you are from, know that you are welcome. And we're not actually going to call anybody a snowflake. Now, millennials were the generation that were first labeled snowflakes, and I myself am a millennial, so maybe that's why it's okay for me to be the one who introduces this term for the purposes of today's conversation. And it was interesting because in the course of promoting this event, we got some pushback on the title, in particular on the term snowflake, because it is a derogatory way of referring to someone who's easily offended and lacks resilience. And that is precisely why we chose the term, because it cuts to the heart of our theme for this year at the Drucker Forum, namely creative resilience, leading in an age of discontinuity. And um, that's from our in-person forum, our management bonanza in Vienna, Austria at the end of November. And I hope to see some of you there. Let me introduce myself briefly before I introduce our panelists. My name is Jyoti Guptara, and I help organizations to storify their strategy and equip managers with narrative intelligence because oh. stories have a way of making what's theoretical and abstract, concrete and relatable. And today we're going to be exploring the management of age diverse teams. We'll be diving into all sorts of questions around generations, age, aging, and how longevity is changing the makeup of the workplace. And I think we'll have a great balance today of theory, but also practical examples. Now, let me start with one of those. Just around the corner from where I live, there's a company that makes office furniture, really high-end stuff. And I was surprised to learn that in this industry, which is very physical, you know, carpentry, they had five generations working side by side. So a 15 year old apprentice, that is somebody from Gen Z, was rubbing shoulders with the company's founder who was in his eighties. And I recently got to know this octogenarian master carpenter. And he told me that his career and actually his company only really took off when he officially retired, because that's when he finally had time to design the innovative furniture that he'd always dreamt of. So right into his 80s, this gentleman was designing new electrified beds and hospitals were ordering them in droves. Five generations, could that one day soon be the norm? And what does it mean for companies and managers? I will welcome at this point, just a, a brief, introduction to our panelists who are going to help me answer these questions or explore them. Um, we have Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, an expert on gender balance and generational balance. We have Chad Osorio, a really bright millennial who has already made a name for himself in multiple domains. And last but not least, we have Lolita Taylor, who's been pioneering intergenerational mentoring at the BBC. Now, before we hear from our esteemed panel, a quick note, towards the end of this session, we're dedicating a block of time to your questions, but you don't have to wait. Feel free to use the chat function at any time to share your thoughts. Speaking of which, we want to hear from you now. So may I invite the technical team to please pull up the poll. Great, thank you very much. Because before we dive into today's discussion, we'd love to get a sense of your experiences and perspectives about generational dynamics in the workforce. So please take a moment. Number one question, which generation are you? And we have here a little definition of the different generations. So far, millennials are in the lead. Go millennials. 
there are a surprisingly large percentage of Gen Z members. So I'll have to be careful what I say about the younger generation. It tends to always be the younger generation that gets bashed by the generation that goes ahead, doesn't it? We even have somebody from Generation Alpha, which is very exciting to me. That young individual has a very promising uh, career ahead of them if they're joining a session such as ours. And we even have a member or some members from the silent generation, which is that um, world war generation that's sometimes called the greatest generation. And isn't that a high bar to live up to? Great, thank you so much for answering um, the first question. And I'll scroll down. How many generations are currently represented in your workplace? Now, people are still answering, but it's a tie between three and four generations, with three generations coming in at first. And some people don't know, and that's fine. In fact, you don't have to start adding anything up. You can um, answer instinctively, maybe, how many generations do you think are currently at your place of work? Third question, have you ever had a disagreement at work? that you believe was primarily due to generational differences? And we have a clear response here. Over 60% say yes, um, but it's good to hear that a lot of people have not had that kind of disagreement. Oh, this is a hot button one. We've all heard horror stories about a millennial or Gen Z breaking down because they couldn't take constructive criticism. and. Quite a lot of you actually have experienced that, over half. So um, as you can tell, it's not just uh, an invention of some um, consultant who wanted to talk about this topic. It is a thing, um, but we'll dive into what might really be going on there in a moment with our esteemed panel. And finally, our fifth question, do you believe that younger generations have a different work ethic? than older generations. Wow, this is the clearest answer yet, with a whopping 90% of you saying, yes, the younger generations do have a different work ethic. Thank you so much, everybody, for your interaction, which I know will make this even more insightful. So before we unpack all of this in our panel discussion, we are in for a treat because we are about to hear from a very special surprise guest. As the president of the Peter Drucker Society Europe, this man has been a relentless force championing the continuous improvement of the practice of management. Our surprise guest was chief learning officer at IBM, where he served in various senior roles. He was instrumental in developing IBM's PC business in Europe, and he helped pioneer e-learning. And as the visionary behind the Global Peter Drucker Forum, he's fostered a platform where the wisdom of the past meets the movers and shakers of the present and future. And uh, I really enjoy being a part of such a place where people from every generation can learn from each other. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our founder president, Richard Straub. Thank you. R Richard, and I'm not sure if we'll be pulled up to the uh, speaker view. Ah. I have to change the speak of you myself. Great to see you, Richard, and thank you for joining us. You've had a rich career spanning several decades. You were recently decorated with the grand decoration of honor by the Republic of Austria, which recognized the impact of the Drucker Forum. What is your secret to maintaining such energy and passion over so many years? And are we allowed to ask how old you are? Uh, thank you, Giotti. Very happy to be here and to to contribute a bit uh, to this discussion. Um, yes, I'm I'm ready to out myself in terms of my age. Um, That's brave most... of you. <laughs> um, I'm I'm 77 years old. No way. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was not fishing for compliments, uh, but that's what it is, right? 77 years. And uh, 
um, when you say what is, what is the secret, I, I, I'm not sure if there's a secret, but um, there is, um, I think there is a question if, if you are doing something which you strongly feel that you want to do it and that it makes sense. And uh, I, I think what's also important uh, for people and, and where you see a difference sometimes in older ages, can you keep the curiosity and engagement and openness? And can you continue to learn? Some people say, well, you are really old when you stop learning, right? So as long as you learn, you remain in some way uh, young. And I think these are these are things that play a role. And obviously, when you get older, you you learn to take care of yourself in a better way than you did before. You didn't think about a lot of things uh, when, when you are young. Richard, do you believe in retirement? Or, or what does this term retirement mean to you? Yeah, there, there is an anecdote around that. Because when I was in my early 50s, I, I just... By, by chance ran into the famous Drucker article, Peter Drucker article, Managing Oneself. I, I guess many of you may know it, have read it. It's one of the, and, and Art Ignatius tells us from HBR, it's, it was the best selling uh, Harvard Business article ever. So if you don't know it, I, I recommend to take a look. And in this article, Drucker uh, describes also the phases of life. And um, it had deep impact on me, certainly. And I think it has a lot of impact on others uh, because this is why it's so successful. It has a deep impact that I started to think differently about what he called the second half of life. Um, and Aviva would say the third and fourth quarter, right? So it really was a game changer in some way uh, for me. And I, I thought differently about it. And thinking differently, that included uh, the conclusion that for knowledge workers, there is no retirement as long as they are in good health. And I think in today's world, many people would reconfirm that. They have something to contribute. And in this sense, it was a big change uh, for me. And it was a big change about thinking about retirement. No retirement for knowledge workers. I'm not sure how our audience feels about that, because I assume most of us are knowledge workers. Richard, you not only witnessed, but you actively shaped the evolution of management across generations. Um, you were at IBM for, I believe, over 32 years. Um, one thing I admire about you is how you've been keen to bring young people into the debate. So as someone towards the other end of the age spectrum, in your experience, how are young people today different from young people in your generation? Yeah, I mean, there, there are these stereotypes, obviously, about the different generations. And the, probably it's true that there are some differences culturally, um, you know, um, culturally induced in some way. Um, uh, but I, I think when when I think about the Drucker Forum and, and the young, the young people we and the different generations we have at the forum, I think it's always the interest in in the cause, in the purpose in what, what we are doing and if it, is it worth it? Because we are nonprofit, so we are not an attractive employer, so to speak, uh, financially, but I think we have a, a, a cause that people can embrace. And um, uh, as it happens, you know, there's, so much, there's so much discussion about uh, remote working. We are the, um, yeah, almost an example yeah, of a, of a of a virtual organization because we are spread around the world and we cannot meet too often. And still, I think we have a good coherence, a strong coherence, which, which is given by our common purpose and our common interest. And what I'm always saying about the unique opportunity to meet so many outstanding people. Uh, this is what 
I think makes it most attractive, certainly for me, and I think also for many of my young colleagues. That's the perfect segue to my final question, Richard, because uh, I've been honored to have been involved with the Drucker Challenge essay contest. Um, the Drucker Challenge is an international essay competition exploring a current topic in management, uh, quite often closely tied to the annual theme of the Global Peter Drucker Forum. And I always find it incredibly rewarding to read these essays of the young um, managers or entrepreneurs in one category and the students in the other category. Um, so tell us why you and Ilza founded the Drucker Challenge in 2009. Um, and when you were young, were there opportunities like the Drucker Challenge that helped young professionals engage with more experienced managers? When I was young, uh, my recollection is mm, there wasn't there wasn't so much you know, of this kind. The world was still very parochial in some way. Uh, you you started to look internationally, but there was not the type of connections that we see today. And as you know, the the world opened up gradually in the 70s and 80s, right? So drug um, challenge type of event. I, I certainly wasn't getting close to anything, anything like that. Uh, when well, you mentioned Ilse and and me, and Ilse was the driving force on this uh, to. Uh, implement and and conceive the Drucker Challenge as a young generation um, element of the Drucker Forum. And now, by the way, in its 14th year. So next year, the Drucker Forum is now 15 years old. The Drucker Challenge will celebrate its 15th anniversary next year. And we will find a special way to celebrate it. But it was obvious for us that a forum that normally attracts rather the older generation because they can travel to Vienna, they can afford a number of things that are related to a conference, needs special uh, tools, so to speak, to include the young generation. And I think that's what successfully happened. And we, we really got people from all over the world, uh, from other continents. And it's, it's a wonderful addition uh, to the Drucker Forum. Oh, I'm looking forward to that anniversary then. Incidentally, one of our panelists is actually a past winner of the Drucker Challenge, and we will be hearing from Chad Osorio in a minute. Let's have a round of virtual applause for Richard Straub. Richard, thank you so much for kickstarting this conversation, for being candid with us. Thank you for all that you do, not just for answering my questions today, but everything you do to ensure the, that future generations can continue to benefit from Peter Drucker's wisdom and that we can all enjoy a world increasingly shaped by his philosophy as opposed to the competing philosophies that we all find ourselves up against. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank now you. let's bring on the first of our three panelists. And I really can't think of a better expert for today's topic than Aviva Wittenberg. Cox. She is the CEO of 21st, which works with organizations who want to capture the competitive advantages of the future of work, talent, and demographic trends. Aviva was recently recognized as one of the world's 40 most inspiring women over 40, and her book, Why Women Mean Business, don't you just love that title, was awarded the Manpower Best Book of the Year prize. Congratulations, Aviva. And in, in addition to your books, you share your thought leadership as a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review and Forbes. And you just spent a year at Harvard as a, an advanced leadership fellow researching all things related to longevity, gender differences in aging, and navigating later life transitions. And you've beautifully summarized all of that in your latest publication, Thriving to 100 Through Life's Four Quarters, which Richard briefly alluded to. Let's give Aviva a warm welcome. Thank if we you. haven't done that already. Thank you. <laughs> Aviva, you're a senior advisor to the drug team, so you, you know Richard uh, quite well. And as someone who advises organizations on age balance, how does what Richard shared resonate? 
very much you can imagine that we have spoken over the years about this. Um, I think I've accompanied Richard through a good part of his third quarter. Um, and so watching him enter his fourth is, is a real pleasure. And I will learn from him, as will many organizations. And I think the issue is Drucker was, as often, ahead of his time. So Richard was quoting Drucker, who wrote about this new generational balance in the workplace between the over 50s and under 50s. He did not talk about generations. He talked specifically about an age balance, which I find useful and perhaps relevant to today's conversation. Um, and he wrote about that in 2001. And we are now in 2023. And if you ask organizations to give you the number of their employees over the age of 50, or within 10 years of the official retirement in their countries, most will not have that number off the top of their heads. Um, the workplace, as are most individuals, is still profoundly ageist. We haven't quite woken up to this new, fast aging world, which is a massive geopolitical, social, and economic transformation to a demographic pyramid we have never experienced as a species. So we're going to need a lot of good leadership and good management to navigate the unexpected. And I'm delighted to see in your poll that this audience today looks pretty generationally balanced, which is a good reflection of where the world is heading. Uh that's great context for our discussion, Aviva. Why do you think Richard has been able to attract volunteers, uh, especially across ages, to join forces at the Drucker Forum? I think he's absolutely right to talk about purpose. Uh, the issue of leadership, management and innovation, and especially this, this year's theme of resilience, is something that I think is extremely affected by intergenerational exchanges. Um, I think the older are bring resilience from their experience of the life quakes that they've already had and just how much the world can be turned upside down in a lifespan like Richard's. Um, if we're counting backwards 77 years, We've seen a couple of world wars. We've seen an awful lot of change of every kind, technology, space, AI, and the rest. Those are transformations that are hard to navigate. And if you've navigated a few of them over seven and a half decades, I think it builds resilience. We have lots to learn from the old. Thank you, Aviva. We do indeed. There's a reason why cultures such as my own, my father comes from India, have tremendous respect, especially for the aged. In fact, when I meet some of my relatives in India who are older, I stoop and touch their feet with my right hand, certainly not with my left hand, and, and place my hand over my heart. Um, so I appreciate what you're doing. Um, Maybe pushing it a bit far for many of us, but hey, we're, we'll get there. <laughs> I, won't, I won't suggest we start doing that at the workplace. <laughs> Viva, we'll, I'm, we'll... I'm ready, but I don't think my kids are. <laughs> <laughs> Would be nice for the parents, wouldn't it? Um, we want to hear from our youngest panelist next, and we will be hearing more from Aviva in a moment. But I just want to introduce uh, Chad and Lolita first. So um, our next panelist that we'll be welcoming, Chad Osorio, is, to be honest, a difficult chap to introduce because of the sheer breadth of what he's done despite his youth. And I say that as someone who is, I think, one or two years older <laughs> than Chad. Chad Osorio has won multiple awards as a writer, but also as a photographer with his works gracing the walls at Harvard Law School and United Nations conferences. And that's all on the side. Chad Patrick Osorio is a lawyer slash economist and university senior lecturer for the economics of law and regulation. Now, Chad is a millennial. Um, and he's not just talking about change, he's actively driving it. Chad is the co-founder and chief legal officer of Sociov. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Chad? Was it Sochov? Yes. Sociov, a, a data-driven data tech platform for coaching and mentoring. 
Uh, he's also the co-founder of 1407 the Gray Malkin Group, a global initiative of young high achievers volunteering as speakers, trainers, and mentors for underserved youth around the world. Please join me in welcoming Chad. Now, most importantly, Chad, you are a Drucker Challenge winner. And last year, you won the first place in the professional category, that is the managers or entrepreneurs category of the Drucker Challenge. So congratulations once again. And tell us what it was like to win the Drucker Challenge. What did it do for you? Um, thank you, Jyoti, first of all, for that wonderful introduction, and I'm very glad to be on this amazing panel. Um, as regards to your question, I think the Drucker Forum, when I say the Drucker Forum changed my life, I am not kidding. Um, I met some of the most amazing people there, um, which who I still remain in contact up to now. We would email each other every once in a while. We've met each other in Paris and um, in India, in the Philippines, all of us traveling together because it was such a culture of sharing information, experiences, and we were learning from each other. And it was just amazing. So um, we can, um, there, there you go, Richard, you hear that? It's, it's working, um, but I think you already <laughs> knew that. Uh, Chad, when did you become aware of differences in the way generations think? Um, I think um, early on, I, I started university at around 14 or 15, around 15, um, and I had a lot of younger, uh, older people in my batch. So I think there would be a difference already in how people would process things. But at the same time, also having entered the workforce at 19, I was working with people who are much older than I, I am, I, I was, and um, we, I had a lot of things to learn from what they were doing. And I think that was a very enriching part of, um, of my working experience. So for sure, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because the difference in thinking made me realize a lot of things about myself and also helped me improve in becoming a better version of me. That's really interesting, Chad. Yeah, because it's um, when differences come up against each other or contrasts serve to highlight um, things. And, and of course, as a photographer, you're all too familiar with how that works. Thank you so much, Chad. Um, that really resonates because I published my first book when I was 17 years old. And the publishing industry is also a little on the older side uh, on average. We will be hearing more from Chad and Aviva in just a moment. But first, please welcome our third and final panelist, Lalita Taylor, an executive producer at the BBC where she holds multiple roles. Lolita is a director of hybrid learning events. She's also the co-chair of BBC Wisdom, or it, well, it sounds a bit like wisdom, doesn't it? But it stands for Women in STEM, S-T-E-M, which is an employee resource group of the BBC. Lolita is also a digital communications advisor for international nonprofits. And she was recognized as a fellow at the Society of Leadership. She also serves on several boards. And I just want to highlight two. Um, Lolita, first, you're a founding trustee of the Fathers Development Foundation. And of course, parents have a lot to do with generations and raising the next generation. And equally fitting for today's topic, you're an advisory board member for Noon, an organization for Queen Ages. Mm -hmm. But Lalita, what are Queen Ages? Well, Queen Ages are amazing women. And um, I, I just wanted to go back a little bit in what you, when you were introducing me. Um, I always have, every decade, I try and sort of, two years before the decade comes, try and think, what are the challenges and how am I going to live that following 10 years, which are really a gift. And um, before I turned 50, um, I was looking forward to the fifth decade, um, my 50s. And um, what happened was um, something tragic, uh, a tragic incident happened. My husband passed away suddenly at 48. And at 49, I found that my 50s was completely uh, wiped out. And I found I had a completely blank um, canvas. So I thought to myself, you know, here I am, a woman in my 50s, 
with no trajectory of what I planned. And, um, and so I started really thinking, you know, how could I look after my kids? How could I function? How could, could I pay the bills? Luckily, the BBC um, welcomed me back with a new job, and my job is uh, knowledge sharing at the BBC um, for a project called Fusion. And um, just, uh, and then what happened was I, I experienced that sort of journey of really um, trying to fill my canvas. And now at 58 years old, I'm in the happy position of, um, again, you know, two years before my 60s, thinking, what am I going to do in my 60s? And I thought, why don't I actually um, look at that demographic of women, you know, who are in their 50s? And of course, my story, I hope, does won't happen to anyone else. But, you know, it was very tragic. And I have that sort of strength and resilience. And I really mm -hmm. wanted to... Um, to, um, and that's why when Eleanor Mills, who's a tour de force of Noon, approached me to say, would I be on her board? I said, yes, because I really understand what um, the, the problems are when you are in your 50s and something completely different happens. And that is just one story, but there's so many stories. And I just want to lend my strength and, my, and bring value to that um, age group and there are a massive age group for the working economy from 45 to 60 they are um, 8 million of the workforce and I think that age group um, needs to be um, valued and given um, opportunity and voice and um, and also understand technology and I'm really lucky in that the job that I do at the moment is about uh, understanding tele technology and bringing um, the two divides from um, the editorial to digital tech together and also my other role as um co-chair of the bbc wisdom has given me another um another string to my bow that i can bring value and also recently i've taken on the role of ambassador for the age irrelevance uh, organization and again you know i really want to foster this sort of inclusive society um that kind of helps each other and creates a dialogue between um generations and really sort of um mentors and shares experience and we come to the question that you asked me first can we queen ager well yeah i'm really proud to be a queen ager <laughs> thank you so much lalita also for sharing one of what was it uh, Aviva called a life quake and, and that tragic experience certainly was a life quake and I'm glad you came through it so well and are sharing what you've learned and developed in terms of resilience with many other people. Um, we have met all three of our panelists and we are in the middle of our topic. Uh, we've seen what they bring to the table so um, I hope you're as excited as I am. Um, Let's start this somewhat controversial um, term, snowflake or, or generation, right? Um, I want to start by picking on the younger generation for a moment. So I'll um, ask Chad to be ready with an answer. Chad, we need to talk about resilience because we millennials have been labeled generation snowflake. Why is that? Well, the general connotation for snowflakes is that, is that it melts easily, right? Um, so it has been um, a term used for younger people because we tend to like melt easily, apparently, against, uh, against these criticisms. But I was actually thinking about this. And what I think, at least from my perspective, is that words are power. And if we use this power to define us, or we can use this word to derive power from it, because after all, a thousand, a, th a million snowflakes become an avalanche. Okay. So um, at least from my perspective, we can use this term, not as a derogatory term, but also as something that we can draw strength from. Wow, that's a first. I have not heard that before, but I love it. Thank you, Chad. Um, it's it's not just about the older generation bashing the younger one either, because um, I have to say that I've been having conversations with friends about resilience and and uh, across the board, I, I do hear from most of my friends that um, we recognize the older generation can be more resilient, at least when it comes to certain um, aspects of their lives. Uh, for example, my father launched a publishing company when he was 71 years old, uh, which was just after my mother died. So uh, another one of these life quakes. And he responded by 
um, uh, founding Pepper Ran Burks, which is especially for uh, Indian themes. And, uh, you know, my dad works longer hours than I do um, in his mid 70s. Um, so a question for the whole panel. How do we explain? Uh, first of all, is it true? And if it's true, how do we explain that younger generations, whether that's millennials or Gen Z, may be less resilient when it comes to certain parts of their lives? Um, my wife is a nurse and she talks to a lot of people in their 80s and 90s. And she actually just told me about someone who, when um, she bought a farm, this was several decades ago, um, the condition on which she was sold the farm was that she would take after, uh, look after the old farmer um, that she was buying it from. Now, this lady had six children of her own. Now, any one of these three responsibilities is huge. And I can imagine that I would have melted in that situation. Who wants to have a go at answering this? I'm happy to take a go at this sort of thing. Uh, I, I do think that a lot of these generational stereotypes and um, describing one age group by any term, and by the way, I think seniors is almost equally as insulting as snowflakes. I hope both of those terms disappear quite quickly. It's clickbait. Come on, let's admit it. This is not a real phenomenon. Most of us boomers have given birth to some of our very favorite millennials and Gen Zs, and we get along better and there are less generational differences today than probably at any other time in history. We listen to the same music, we wear the same sneakers, we are in interested in many of the same apps and platforms. The differences, we can hunt for them and we can let the forces at play, of which there are many trying to divide us desperately, or we can actually see that we have never been so similar, working together so closely, except that we're traditionally, for many millennia of human history, we already did work together across generations. There were family farms and tribes. Um, there was a blip in history, which we are just emerging from, that was incredibly age segregated. We are now gently going beyond that, back into what I think is a much more normal mixing up of generations where age has less impact than stage. And I think we'll start thinking far more um, about what I like to call life's four quarters. What development phase are you in? What do you need to explore and build in yourself? And what impact do you want to have on the world? Why don't you go ahead, Aviva, and give us just a very brief definition of the four quarters and what's uh, maybe important in each of these, or, or how do you usually explain the four quarters? So the four quarters is a, is a wink to the corporate world that loves to talk about performance in quarters. How was your Q1? How was your Q2? And it's extrapolating that to the new phenomenon that we're all going to live a lot longer than we think. Half the children born today are going to live to be 100 years old. If you divide up 100 years into quarters, you get about a 25 year chunk of each. So Q1 is zero to 25, I call that learning. Q2 is uh, where a lot of the work world focuses on today, which is 25 to 50, that's achieving. Q3 is the really new piece that we're only just discovering thanks to these extended lives. It's the fit 25 years after 50, which I call becoming. Lalita described it very well, where suddenly you become the person you probably always were, um, but to the nth degree. And Q4, which Richard is just so beautifully demonstrating for us, is a time of harvesting where you gather all that you have sown, enjoy it and spread it and give and grow to the end. So those are a bit the four quarters. And I'd say um, one of the issues that we have to deal with is the world and our minds are designed very much for a three-step life, which is extraordinarily focused only on Q2. And that no longer fits the motivations, interests, or needs 
of what is an exploding Q3 segment. Stage rather than age. I like that. Thanks, Aviva. Now, I want to, or, or to be fair, we have to pick on the older generations as well. So, um, Lalita, you mentioned that you're responsible yeah. for sharing tech learnings, and uh, you do help drive transformational change at the BBC. So, to tackle some more cliches, do young people learn tech faster, and do older people tend to resist change? It's a really interesting question because I think tech is now completely uh, leveled the playing field because the cycle of tech has really gone, I mean, it's literally non-existent in the sense that new technology keeps coming on and we're seeing new iterations all the time. And in the there was a time at the BBC when we would take uh, bring new tech on by take uh, and we train um, a section of people, we'd have super users who would um, be the floor walkers. So you'd have um, people being trained in the classroom and then they would go onto the floor and, and do the uh, and use the new uh, the tech. And then they would have floor walkers who would help them um, you know, with, with answering questions. And I think that is a completely obsolete thing because if we did that now, the tech would be out of date anyway. So um, I think we have to embrace tech and all generations need to embrace tech in a way that we have to think, why are we using the tech and what value does it have? And also in a way, uh, if I kind of think of the analogy, you know, we drive a car, but we have so many different cars and um, it's just a question of learning how to drive the different cars. And I think that is the kind of approach I think we should have for tech. But I think where we really need to grow ourselves as human beings and as different generations is the soft skills and the skills that I want to bring up are things like you know being um, kind to each other because that kindness in the workplace will mean that people are more able to share ideas and not feel they're going to get shouted down and I am very keen to build in my team who are a range of ages from you know older to younger and for me it's irrelevant what age they are because they all bring value to the table and they all do the specific different jobs that actually make the project agile and flourish and so I would say um, you know those skills such as you know a curiosity uh, interest open-minded um, and and some of you know, some of them are quite old fashioned, like service. I mean, service is like to the team, making sure people are not struggling. And if you help them, then actually it makes uh, for an ally. And then finally, you know, it's, it's graciousness. And I think that's a lovely thing to be because gracious is to be, you know, to have the challenge, to stand up, to, uh, to know when to challenge and also when to step back. And, you know, you want to create a harmonious learning environment. And so my role as a leader is to make sure that I have a, a range of people in my team who are committed to making the project work, but also injecting a bit of fun because we are all um, cross-generational and we can mentor each other through the generations. Yeah, tell me more about your intergenerational mentoring at the BBC. How does that work? Um, well, I have to say, I am not speaking for the BBC. I am an individual here. And um, I think what I'm particularly interested in is that there are no labels and we are all uh, bringing value. And I take real interest in understanding and listening to stories that what people are experiencing and um, I know a 66 year old who has uh, actually come back to the BBC and is doing a job that she did in her 20s and um, I asked her how she's finding it she said she loves it because second time round she feels familiar with what's expected of her and she is really um, feels you know um, just loves it um, and then I asked her how are other people in the team, um, you know, taking, seeing her within the team. And she says the the 20 year olds are a little bit uncomfortable with her. And she actually had a conversation with a 20 year old, which she related to me. And this 20 year old said she feels uncomfortable giving her junior tasks because of her age seniority. 
And I found that really interesting. And I said, well, how did you overcome that? And she said, well, I just told her that, you know, I'm here part of the team and it doesn't matter how old I am, but what I want to do is to bring value and I want to learn and I can learn from you. And that sort of broke the ice. And what was great was that there was that sort of conversation. But I will tell you one more story, which was actually quite interesting. And it's a friend of mine yesterday, I was telling her that I was going to be on this panel and she's in her 50s and she's got a nursery. And she said to me, she has a worker, a new worker, and she, who didn't turn up, who's 24. And she phoned her up in the morning and says, said, where are you? And she said, um, and, and her sister, apparently her, her sister picked it up and said, oh, she's just having a lie-in. And, um, <laughs> and I was just kind of like really bemused. But then I really thought about it. And I thought, well, she's 24 and probably her sister is younger. And I think younger, the younger generation, we have to understand the job that they're doing is not the only job. They're very multi. And I think they have a totally different understanding. And I think the generation, there is just so much that they have that they have to contend with that, that you know, people of our generation um, don't didn't have. I mean, we didn't have social media. Life was a bit utopian in the sense that we had time off. We weren't always on. And I think we need to kind of really have that dialogue and understand, you know, and actually set boundaries and say, well, you know, this is, um, you know, something I would expect and, and create that sort of um, understanding and, and make the person feel that they're still wanted. Yeah, well, it's great to hear you can have those kinds of conversations at the BBC. And thank you for pioneering this field. I also wanted to pick up on what you said about kindness and, of course, uh, being gracious, which goes very well with uh, being a queenager. Um, uh, the Harvard Business Review has a um, series of articles that we publish at the Drucker Forum in advance of the the forum in November. And the first of those articles were, was on being kind in management. Now, Aviva talked about stage, not age. So I just want to dig into this idea of longevity for a bit and how that could change the workforce and management. Um, and I'll open it up to any of our panelists, but um, with top heavy demographics, as in less young people to support the aged, will old people be forced to work longer to support themselves? And will um, retirement be replaced with resentment? We've heard from people like Richard Straub who are enjoying this phase of life and creating so much value, but that might not be everyone, even other knowledge workers. What do you think in terms of, of the um, forces at work here? Um, does more old people in the workforce mean more competition for young people, less opportunities for promotion? So to the question of, do we have to work longer? Yes, the answer is very clearly for the vast majority of people listening to this uh, discussion. Uh, if you look at any government finances about retirement and pensions, they are not resilient. They are not prepared. Uh, the calculations aren't being communicated because the politicians know that the election cycle is short and the mammoth pension uh, meltdown heading our way is a longer term issue that they can push away and ignore. So are we gonna have to work longer, whether we accept it or not, whether we go down in the streets and fight it as many countries will, not just the French, this will be a rolling story. Um, we are in for mammoth change. And I'm afraid we're not discussing it clearly enough. I think it's just hitting the mainstream, perhaps in the last year post pandemic. Um, and it will change everything. The fact that uh, I, I would avoid uh, Jyoti uh, expressions, we have to become very aware of our language. So I would avoid expressions like top heavy generational balance. We have a new generational balance that will be more equal between older and younger. What are the consequences of that? There'll be multiple. Will there be more competition? Will there be more? It, 
depends on, you know, there'll be good companies that know how to manage that shift. There'll be lots of bad companies that don't know how to manage it. The reality is that there will, will be massive talent wars. There already are. There aren't enough young people to fuel our current economic machines. Countries are shrinking. Demog demographics are tumbling. So the reality is we need everybody and desperately what we need, and we're already hearing about that a lot in the UK, is we need people who have retired to come back into the workforce because we need their skills, their experience, their knowledge, and their networks. Competition, no, they're gonna be really grateful for as many people that we can keep healthy and engaged, but that's a massive challenge and individuals aren't ready for it. We've been educated to retire at 65. We're already a little bit grumbling about retiring at 68. The reality is that most of us are going to be working well into our 70s if we're lucky enough to be able to. Could I ask the tech team, please, to pull up our Gallup slide? Because this ties really nicely into what Aviva is saying. So you can see here, managers' engagement and the perceptions that employers care about their well-being. And this is declining, right? More and more managers over the last few years, um, even since the pandemic, or we could say especially since the recovery, are feeling that they are not cared for. And Aviva's telling us that there are going to be massive talent wars, there's a talent squeeze. So again, open to any of our panelists, how do we reconcile what seems to be going on at organizations with the fact that we do need this talent? Um, if I would okay. just want... Oh. Please, Chad. Oh, okay, um, I'd like to um, say something about this, but this time from personal experience and also from the experience of my colleagues. Um, interestingly, um, I do agree that from a macroeconomics perspective, what Aviva said is totally true. We need more people in the workplace because of the changing demographics, and we need more people to fund the pensions. But the challenging thing is for young people, um, we already get a lot of um, advertisements uh, where they accept new grads, but they need 10 years of experience. Um, those kinds of jokes, right, that you have to have to, you have to have like, eight years of uh, internship before you actually even get the paid job. So having more people with all of these experience and all of these learnings is essential, again, for macroeconomic policy and also for the knowledge building. But at the same time, for young people, it does not necessarily give them, it gives them the social, uh, the learning opportunities, but not necessarily the social economic opportunities. Because at the end of the day, we would want to earn as much, uh, at least um, a living wage, but if we're competing with other people who are earning a lot more and with a lot more experience, that's going to be a challenge. And I know this personally because I also know an international organization which shall not be named. Um, and I know that they have a retirement policy age. Um, but it's so hard to get into this particular organization precisely because even after people have retired, um, they take in the older um the older generation and keep them as consultants, which does not open slots for the younger people who want to get into this organization. And this is challenging even for um, high achieving professionals, such as uh, um, lawyers or economists who want to get into that organization. So right. I think from a macro microeconomics perspective where people make decisions based on these um, financial, uh, and economic uh, situations, then this could be a challenge, especially for the younger generation. Yeah. Um, one of the things that our generation is um, that gets bashed about is job hopping. But I think you've put your finger on a very relevant topic. Are there opportunities to be promoted within the same organization? Um, I know some organizations are keen to promote internally, uh, which, which is great, but what you share about unpaid um, internships. I was just in Kenya and I was talking with a young man. I couldn't believe it. He'd been through a one year internship, which was unpaid in a country which is as hand to mouth um, as, as Kenya. And what's more, he's expected to go into another one next. So he still doesn't have the prospect of, of decently paid, or fairly paid work. Now, in just a few minutes, I do want to 
I wanted to also add um, to this as well. Um, in my sector, um, the broadcasting sector, um, there is a huge um, job shortage. And uh, so, uh, and we are definitely looking for more people to return. And um, it's part of the fact that um, we had the uh, pandemic and people were watching lots, binge watching. And so as a result, there is need for a lot of content to be created. And what's interesting is that I think lots of people across different disciplines don't realize that in filmmaking and in uh, making programs, you do need lawyer skills, you do need HR skills, you do need um, you know, a whole range of skills. So I think um, I would encourage anyone who knows of someone who's looking for work to look at the screen industries because if you're a, a doctor or an HR person, you're just focusing on a particular field, you, you're more likely to get work if you come and look in the screen industries. Very interesting. Thanks. If my um, PhD doesn't work out, I will definitely look at the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> And, and given your writing accolades, I'm, I'm sure you would be a great fit. Now, in just a few minutes, I do want to go over to our public Q&A and um, see what our participants have been writing in the chat. And um, maybe Aviva, Lalita or Chad have been keeping up with, with the chat. And maybe you see a particular question that you would like to answer. But I would invite all of you who are with us to take the opportunity to start writing your questions if you haven't already done so. Um, let's just end our um, internal little discussion that we're having here with um, Chad, you mentioned that when you were very young, in your early 20s, you were given a, a leadership role and you had to manage people who were much older than you were. So I would be very curious, what did you learn about managing as a young person, people who are older than yourself? I think um, this, uh, this resonates with what Ladita said a while ago about um, her 20 year old and uh, her 20 year old colleague with the 50 year old colleague. I think um, it's, it's tricky, especially if you do not have necessarily the same perspectives. You want to make sure that you get your point across without also have, without also at the same time being respectful, but at, not at the same time not crossing boundaries. So it's really, really important um, to be respectful, but also, um, you know, be firm about what you want to say. And it comes back to what Peter Drucker wanted to say, well, he said it already, all about, um, it's all about communication and empathy. So I think at least working with people older than I am, I was and am, and also younger than I am because mentoring the next generation, the Gen Zs. Um, it's very important that we look at both of this. How do we communicate and how do we empathize? Because at the end of the day, those two questions are what can help us uh, determine how to bridge these different stages that Aviva is mentioning and also the different ch the, the challenges that Lalita just mentioned. Yeah. Um, Aviva and Lalita, what would be your uh, advice to people who want to uh, take advantage of this demographic shift? Um, what, I, for example, Lalita, how how can people set up their own intergenerational mentoring? I, I think one of the um, the ways I look at it is, I always think of my job script, my my job with elastic boundaries, and I think if people could see their jobs as with elastic boundaries, they will have a much, a feeling of uh, freedom in the sense that they can bring value. Because when um, you get your job description, it seems very kind of clear, crystal clear, black and white, what you're supposed to do. And that's because managers have written it very much with what is needed to get the job done. They can't think for you and say, how can you bring value? How can you be happy in your job? How can you um, bring new skills? And I think if you develop those soft skills, such as being curious, interested in knowledge, joining um, a, a different uh, a, you know, a club or, or um, bring, bringing new um, knowledge in and, and sort of talking to your colleagues. And I mean, when I was growing, when I, when I was at the BBC, when I first started, um, I just went, I had 
I had a nickname given to me and it was called Gopher and it means go for courses. And the reason why I went for courses was because I was really interested in finding out what different colleagues in different parts of the BBC were doing and how I could learn. And, and I think that way you build a sort of resilience and I sort of have taken some of those things that I've put, you know, I've experienced and I try and incorporate it into my team and sort of say, you know, your jobs are have elastic boundaries, you know, as long as the job is done, if you're interested in getting, um, you know, uh, getting new experience, I can help you find those experience. And I think that makes a happy team. Aviva, other than welcoming returners back and intergenerational mentoring, what else should organizations be doing right now? Uh, I'm not convinced that they should necessarily be doing any of those things. Uh, I, I think the idea is to really rethink talent without so much reference to age. And so the issue then is, to Chad's point, if somebody's young and able to manage and has relational skills and can, can be built up, to get them. I mean, there are organizations that have now 20 year olds on the C-suite. We've seen 20 year old CEOs start to emerge. If you have that kind of talent and maturity and readiness, let's not minimize what people can do early in life. And let's not minimize what people can do later in life. Let's get much better, which we still don't seem to be very good at, at evaluating talent and output rather than measuring people on what is an increasingly obsolete kind of dimension. Experience may not be the most important issue in a lot of things. We know that already in tech firms where it's some of the young brains that are gonna be more relevant to certain types of work. But usually what organizations are saying is that intergenerational teams that have people of various ages and stages has a lot of benefits. It has benefits in terms of motivation, engagement, reciprocal learning. It's not just mentoring one way up or down. It's we learn from each other from different parts of what our strengths are at this time of our lives. And I think Tim Cox is asking, how do you respond to the sort of generational theory? The trouble with generational theory is it's a bit of a stereotype of anybody born at a particular time of history. When really, if you're trying to compare a 20 year old today to a 40 year old, you've got to compare that future 40 year old to today's 40 year old. You've got to compare apples and apples. And what we're predicting is true for a lot of Gen Zers may prove to not be true at all when they hit the usual adult development phases that we see in Q2 and then again in Q3. So I think companies would be well versed to flex. So probably the number one issue companies are bumping up against in this new uh, fast aging world is that they're not flexible enough. Now we've been on this topic for decades with women we're revisiting the issue of flexibility with, interestingly, everybody, what I call millennials, perennials, which are the older folk and a, a, a potential alternative to the word senior that I don't like. Some, some people are proposing perennials. So millennials, perennials, and parents have always needed more flexibility than the workforce wants to give them. Again, we're seeing this post pandemic with all the work from home debates um, and certain companies resisting what is now a completely tech enabled fluidity of where, when and how people work with limits. Lalita, I totally agree with you. We need some constraints on that. Um, and very many companies still are ready to trust people enough to let them be free. They recruit some of the best and brightest and they wanna treat them like children for the rest of their lives in terms of what time they come into the office. So um, all of these issues, I would say number one for corporates is flexibility of what, where and when people work, but also career patterns over time. So right now we're in a very linear, upwardly mobile, single career pattern. 
And what we need more of is much squigglier careers, much more multiple patterns that don't have this cliff edge end where people suddenly retire and are out of the workforce, but, um, and also where they have to keep earning more next year than they did last year. Maybe we'll start to see careers with a much more gentle decline. Um, also in compensation, we're already seeing some in innovations like that in Japan, where it's rather force fed uh, and people have to quit at 65 and then reapply for often lower paying jobs. Um, but that's on our horizon. All of this is going to have to get flexed up and we're going to have to stop thinking so much about age and get back to being much better at evaluating talent and becoming true talent and delivery machines. Lots of changes for organizations. And this brings me to a question from the chat. Can you offer information on how to get all generations back into the office? Many folks believe the younger generations don't ever want to come back to an office. With that reality, there will be no such thing as organizational culture or real team dynamics. Can you please help? Um, even with my psychology background, I refuse <laughs> to help that question precisely because I, I believe that a flexible working arrangement um, would be much better. I believe that people should go back to the office um, during specific times um, and that, you know, at the, the, at the at, uh, regular times, but not necessarily have to go back to the office full time. The development of technology has allowed us to do a lot more things with this flexibility and removing that flexibility and putting into place something again so rigid removes a lot of potential productivity from our, what Aviva was talking about, from our talents and how we use them in the most effective way. So yes, I, I do have some uh, suggestions about it, but I will not share them because I don't want people to have to go back to the office 100%. Lolita, think, how are you? Yeah. yeah. I, I think actually it really depends on the job and it needs to have a uh, the manager and the person, uh, the employee and the team need to sit together and really think how would um, this work? And I think if you have it on a micro level um, rather than having macro, so you have to be in the office um, where people are telling people who don't necessarily know what the job roles are, what they do within the team, I think that's where it can break down. But if you are a manager and you know, know your team and you can say, would it be, you know, I think it would be a good idea if we, you know, met and discussed AYD. I, we, I think we could get more done. Um, I think, you know, there'll be a, a, you know, to have a genuine respect and talk it through. And and I think it, it's easier for me because I'm, I'm working with a small team, but I do have, for certain projects, I take on, you know, lots of freelancers and, um, and, you know, depending on the different job pro projects, um, I need to communicate with each team member and we have, you know, meetings set in place and we work remotely. And then, you know, when, when needs be, we will meet in person, but generally it works really well. But I think, to be honest, it's so, um, it's so individual to teams and to people and to companies and to jobs. Thank you. By the way, we are, um, in case you missed it, Lolita, we are being appreciated in the chat. Nadia um, Otu writes that the point you make about younger generations having multiple commitments is very insightful. And I'm just trying to keep up with, with other comments and questions. How about this one? How can we effectively communicate to Gen Z and Generation Alpha about the importance of investing in their healthy longevity? Well, I have one at home. You're and, qualified um, to tell us then. I don't think so, because I think every Gen Z person is very unique. And, and whatever I say about him may not be the case for everyone else. And I think it's, again, brings me back to what Aviva said at the beginning. You know, these, these labels are maybe, um, you know, a good way of kind of putting people into buckets. But I think what's more... I think for me, what's more important is the stories and, and the real kind of understanding of people in your sector and understanding what they're, they're, what they're experiencing. 
for my Gen Z person, well, um, you know, he's suddenly switched on to work and, and can't get enough of it because he loves it. But this is after three years of being quite sort of lazy. <laughs> So, so I think, you know, I think you'd hate me saying that, but I, I think he needed that time to really sort of adjust to, you know, after having a, quite a, a, you know, a, a life changing experience. So I use lazy in a very affectionate way. I'd also say what's very interesting about this phenomenon of new longevity. We, we are living in a time where the two men vying for the American presidency are both pushing 80, is we are all role modeling future possibilities that we've never seen before. So we are the role models of the next generation who will find from looking around them that the horizon of much greater life expectancy changes many dimensions of life. And I think they are going to be much better prepared the young of today watching their parents age in an entirely new way richard you are our example here for the session still starting conferences running things building companies uh geo to your father this is going to have an impact on this younger generation who will have a different challenge than we did is one of pacing they will have the opportunity to pace themselves over what might be 60 year careers. And so my message for the younger people listening to this kind of debate is take it easy in Q2. Don't think you have to achieve every possible goal and dream before 50, which is what many people think. They're on the rat race to get to what they want to achieve quite early and then hopefully retire many of them when the reality is Q2 is complicated. You want to do a lot of things in Q2. You want to found your companies, your families, your relationships, your work. Um, Q3 is new and it opens this whole other chapter that should be able to give the younger generations a longer runway to do what they want to do with a little bit more ease over time. I'm seeing that already. These are a little bit gendered, these quarters, but I'm already seeing that with a lot of women um, that Lalita was describing, the queen agers post 50, who suddenly now are some of the best career decades of their lives as they take off post children um post some of the responsibilities they had in q2 and are much more intrinsically motivated which is something that richard was pointing to in our opening and and following i just wanted to add uh something that um richard said earlier in the, in the beginning about knowledge and i think for my, my advice um aviva follow, what you've said was has been excellent but i'd also like to add um i think whatever age you are and the younger you are, I think embrace the world of knowledge because knowledge and learning and curiosity and building that experience through knowledge and speaking to other people. So I'd say if you're a Gen Z and you're interested in a particular area or interested in a variety of areas, you know, you're gifted this extra time of taking it a bit slower in Q2. I would suggest, you know, really developing and learning and building that strong knowledge base Absolutely. Yeah, actually, one of the um, one of the questions in in the chat was about education. So I'm glad you spoke to that one, Lalita. Uh, Chad. Um, Were you going to say something? I, I, no, I no, no, I, I'm, uh, I'm nodding and listening. OK, and so, so um, just to, to finish that thought, um, how is learning organ um, changing? One thing Peter Drucker says in Managing Oneself is, of course, that continuous learning must become the norm. And he was prophetic about that, as with so many things. So what changes for organizations in terms of um, the bar to entry or re-entry when knowledge is changing so quickly, skills are changing that are in demand. Um, one of the uh, individuals I'll get to interview for the Drucker Forum quite soon for our book corner, which is part of our Drucker TV um, at the end of November is Ginny Rometti, the former CEO of IBM. And she's now running something called Skills First, 
which is about giving opportunities to people who don't have a degree necessarily, people maybe from disadvantaged backgrounds. But I do like this approach of a skills first mindset for organizations. Um, are we anywhere close or, or what has to change in organizations to encourage skills first thinking and help people to develop those skills no matter their age? I think, um, you know, organizations have learning uh, academies with, within them. And I mean, at the BBC, we have one and there are lots of um, courses and ways in which you can build skills. But also I run a knowledge sharing project, which is um, where we are. Um, I basically talk to different producers and different tech people and come up with learnings where we can um, build that bridge and find the, the gaps in knowledge and, and sort of people then can come to the events and the learning lunches and then talk to various people uh, who are doing the, working in the areas where they may have a skill shortage or want to develop new skills. And I think it's, it's giving networking opportunities where people can then um, go and chat to other people. And I think learning and it doesn't need to be formalized and skill growing doesn't necessarily need to be um, sort of that you need that skills, unless as a manager, you think that particular skill is valuable, then you can work in a different way to create that. But I think um, it's uh, what Aviva says, you know, it's kind of thinking more flexibly, thinking more out of the box. And I think the challenge for managers is to kind of think of new ways to give staff um, opportunities and experience and access to skill growing that will um, be, in, you know, that that will that will work. I agree. I think there's a listen. The, the the elephant in the room is corporate ageism. We have to name it, recognize it, and this is a new phenomenon. This aging thing. We shouldn't expect people to get over this in a year or two. It's going to take just like sexism, just like racism. It's going to take years of educating people that the over fifties are not to be ignored and shuffled out, which by the way, IBM among other companies was one of them who had a big court case against them because that was, it used to be one of their practices, right? As it was in many large organizations, as you try and get people to early retire, you nudge them out, you tell them they're a little bit past their prime, which was the reality not that long ago. And here we are now in an entirely new demographic reality where suddenly we have to educate managers and leaders that this is some of the prime talent they've got and they're going to want to start investing in it big time, retain it, learn how to retain it, engage it, uh, ally it with people of other ages and stages so that they work seamlessly together. That's a whole new management skill. We're not ready. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, it's a positive. Most people are interested in this if you take it well and you don't, you know, kind of make it a competition between generations and ages that's not a good frame um so that takes leadership and we're going to need a lot of it if i can also add to what lalita and aviva said um i think that one of the things that we might also want to consider with these organizations is having mentorship programs so if we want to address the pro the challenge of culture performance networking education and even a mindset change i think um, spearheading mentorship programs, especially one-on-one -on -one mentorship programs, will help people get behind this, um, the stereotypes and learn directly from each other. And at the end of the day, setting people down on the and learning from each other, not just one person, but as Aviva said, not just um, the younger learning from the older, but vice versa, could help open more doors and remove all of these barriers. Because I personally think that there would really be um, there or there are differences, maybe not just generational, but also cultural, but also um, when it comes to race. But all of these things can be addressed if um, companies would have a good bent, well, not would be addressed magically, right? It's not going to be like that, we wish. But it could be addressed by having a good mentorship program to bridge all of these little by little. I'd like to just conclude on I, I've, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but if you'll pardon me, 
that this aging thing and this new longevity world where already 46 countries in the world are shrinking demographically where birth rates have tumbled down to unforeseen levels where china has begun to shrink this this past year where india is suddenly the most popular these are such massive shifts that they require every organization on the planet not just to be tweaking its HR policies to be a little bit nicer to older workers and start working on their internal ageism issues. This is going to require longevity strategies. If you don't have, as an organization in 2023, a longevity strategy, you don't have a corporate strategy. It's going to hit. It's going to hit big and smart companies are already on it. But if you're not, it's a much broader issue. There's also the whole topic we haven't talked about much. It's the consumer base is also aging. And so how are we gonna listen and reflect and service customers with new needs in a very youth oriented marketing culture, right? Most of the people that sell and market uh, tend to be quite young and may not quite have captured that a majority of the purchasing decision makers and a majority of the asset holders are actually over 50. So there's a lot of misalignments that we'll be working on over the next decade. You're going to hear a lot more about this topic, I'm afraid. Uh, this is just the beginning. Well, we're glad we could start the discussion today in such a wonderful manner. Time is flying. We do have just a few minutes left. And um, Aviva, you took the opportunity to name something that we hadn't considered today so far. So I just want to give Lolita and Chad the same opportunity. Um, any holes, any things that we should be thinking about and talking about that we did not have time for today? Um, I'll just go first and mention one other idea that I find fascinating when it comes to generations. Namely, what if we think about generations in terms of how long somebody has been at a particular organization. So um, you could group people by, you know, are they new? Because new people, they ask silly questions, um, which end up maybe not being so silly, especially in an era of change and acceleration. And then you have the, the wise, maybe old, maybe not so old, but people who have been at the organization for a while who can say, well, this is the way things have been done around here. And we have had a few comments about continuity and culture, which seems to indicate, Richard, that we have chosen the perfect topic for our forum in November, leading in an age of this continuity. Lolita and Chad, I'll hand over to you for final comments, words of advice, or, or gaps that we should be thinking about in future. My, my advice is, um, as Aviva says, this, this debate is going to gather pace, and I would like to see that we would focus more on um, gathering stories and really understanding what different sections of um, our society are feeling and actually pull those insights and um, and identify places where there's really good practice going on and come up with some tips and some um, some real kind of understanding. And I, I love the fact that there are different intersectional groups that are setting up that are kind of campaigning for um, you know, a, a sort of change of what we have because what we have doesn't really work. And I think as we're having a um, an aging population, um, we need to change the way and, and the population that is under terrific pressure to find money to fund those extra years. We need to change the way we view the intergenerational um, kind of grouping and we need to talk to each other. And we need to also think of the older generations, not as, and even ignore the word older, because um, I think it's really sort of not thinking, thinking of all of us contributing to society, because the big thing, I think, which is much bigger than a society of different ages, is the AI and the techno technology that's coming. We're going to find with digital twins, with um, avatars, with all these different things, we need to all, as human beings, unite much more, because... Otherwise, um, we're going to find by some by 
not really having a voice and controlling where the direction of the technology is going, that there's going to be, you know, it's going to be a, a difficult world that we live in. So I just think we need to keep talk, talking and really understand that as human beings, we need to unite because there is, um, we mustn't let technology take root or grow, you know, in a way that doesn't really serve us. Thank you, Lolita. What a wonderful closing remark. And I couldn't agree more. We are entering the exponential age. Everything's going to change. Chad, a last word from you, please. Um, this is something that Aviva and I were discussing a while ago. And just as a disclaimer, the 75% on the, on the uh, poster that we did, it's quoted a lot by the media through different um, PwC um, forms, but we need to be careful about showing that number because at the end of the day, we have to be critical about what the number paints. But I believe also that it's very important that out of all the things that we've learned today, we take what they said, what Lalita and, and Aviva said about talking to each other, about working together. And I go back to what Peter Drucker said about learning as a process all throughout life and how even in organizations, whether in private organizations or government organizations, what we need to do is we need to communicate properly and we need to empathize with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Aviva. Thank you, Lolita. It's been a delight and very insightful talking with you. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you for being so candid with us. I do appreciate it, as do all of us listening, and I'm sure. So let's have a big virtual round of applause for our wonderful panelists and for Richard uh, Straub, our surprise guest. And at this point, I'd also like to thank the rest of the team from marketing to IT and admin, a lot of people uh, go into creating a smooth event such as this. And um, I do want to mention that today is only a foretaste of many more such conversations with wonderfully eminent and knowledgeable and wise individuals who will be meeting in Vienna on November the 30th and December the 1st. Come join us at the Global Peter Drucker Forum if you can. Um, the Global Peter Drucker Forum is the world's leading management and leadership conference dedicated to the management philosophy of Peter Drucker. He was a management professor, for those who don't know, a writer and consultant, and is frequently referred to as the father of management. So the forum's theme this year is creative resilience, leading in an age of discontinuity. And uh, you can see in our chat the uh, flyer for that and a link to sign up if you're interested in joining us. However, if you can't make it for any reason, do not fear, we have plenty more content for you um, in the form of Drucker TV. So, um, this is good news because Drucker TV includes exclusive live coverage from the event. It will be different from what you get to experience if you join us in person. Um, and uh, my personal favorite part of Drucker TV is the book corner, where we interview authors of some of the year's iconic management and business books, but maybe I'm biased because I'll be the one doing those interviews. So do please check out our links, find out more about our panelists and continue the conversation on LinkedIn um, and amongst yourselves. Thank you so much for being part of this move movement and I wish you well, whatever your quarter is. <laughs>